Now I know, you know, to be really specific, like how specific you actually need to be when they ask for requirements. Like the term requirement um, is means something very different in, from a like digital infrastructure perspective than it does from like a user perspective, right? Like I require it to be necessary that I, I you know, capture these five fields. But to them, that's like, okay, great. We'll make those required fields. But then how they translate on the back end could be something very different in terms of like why you required them. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples, not just trending ideas or buzzword laden schmaltz, real world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. It is a tight labor market these days. Marketing talent is scarce, so it would only be natural for a marketing leader to do everything they can to hold on to their current team. Hey, that can lead to a lot of positive management practices. However, if you're not careful, you could try to hold on a little too tight and put your interests and your company's interests way out ahead of what would best serve the employee. That's why I love this lesson from our next guest. Appreciate your employees. Let them challenge themselves, provide feedback, and grow, even if it means you're going to lose them. She'll share the stories behind how she learned that lesson, along with many other lessons with us today. Joining me now is Megan Gaynor, the Vice President of Marketing and Communications at DSD Renewables. Thanks for joining us, Megan. Thanks so much for having me. So let's take a quick look at your background here so people know who I'm talking to. You uh, got an MBA from Wharton, Senior Marketing Manager at Comcast. You were a Senior Manager of Energy Marketing for North America at Tesla, Senior Marketing Leader at GE Solar. There's more roles, too many to mention, uh, but also you manage budgets from $1 to $10 million, and you've managed teams from 3 to 15 people during your career. Right now, you're the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for DSD, which stands for Distributed Solar Development Renewables. Uh, DSD recently spun out of GE. You're going to tell us some of those stories. Uh, and is owned by BlackRock. And uh, well, tell us, what does it mean to be the Vice President of Marketing and Communications? Yeah, so it basically means I manage everything from, um, you know, our overarching brand, who we are as a company and what we do and sort of getting that story out there to day-to-day PR, sales support, um, manage all of our digital footprint, um, including website, uh, social channels, etc. So pretty much soup to nuts, everything that is sort of marketing communications, both internally and externally, my team touches. All right, great. Well, you actually, uh, our first lesson comes from that current role. So in the first half of the podcast, we'll talk about some of the things you made. Uh, And one of the first things you made is this brand, DSD Renewables. And the lesson you learn is put stock in your own brand. So so tell us this story. Yeah, so when I joined GE back in 2018, I, um, I, I kind of knew at the time that it was a possibility that we would be spinning ourselves out of GE eventually um, as an organization. Um, what we do at DSD is um, we develop solar projects, um, commercial industrial sized solar projects. And it's something that's very different. It's a business model that's very different from what GE does, which, you know, GE makes a lot of stuff. Um, And so it just didn't really fit within um, sort of like the GE organization. And and we kind of knew that. Um, And so when I joined, I kind of knew that I might need to, to do something like this. I did not realize that I would need to do it, A, so quickly, and B, in such a short period of time. So I joined in the fall of 2018. We started sort of shopping around our platform um, that winter, the following winter, and we had spun out of GE by July of 2019. So when we started shopping ourselves around, um, I was sort of tasked from our CEO, Eric Sheeman, to start, to start thinking about, you know, what would we be called when we, when we spin out? Um, what are some names that we'd banter around? And I did not, obviously, I did not have neither the budget nor the time to do in-depth brand research. Um, well, you know, what, what names would, would make, uh, you know, make a difference in the industry, what names seem to make a lot of sense. 
Um, and so on this, you know, sort of like three to basically had three to six months to come up with a name, come up with a brand and be ready to spin out, you know, in July of 2019. And so you really had to go with like a gut instinct. Luckily, I had been in the industry for a while now um, and I knew the, the big players. Um, I also knew that, um, you know, it's quite possible that our organization would would move and change and evolve over time. So I didn't want to do anything that would pigeonhole us too much um, into a particular thing. Um, and I also knew I was kind of starting from scratch. Um, and so really where this first lesson comes from is like, at some point, you just got to kind of trust your gut and then lean into it. Because if you don't feel confident in it, then the people around you won't feel confident in it. And more importantly, your end customers won't feel confident in it. So, um, so that's kind of where, where we went from it. And it really ended up taking, um, so we spun out, first of all, the, the look on um, my colleagues' faces when I said that we were going to be calling ourselves distributed solar development um, instead of being able to introduce yourself as working for GE. Um, everybody was just, you know, shocked and scared <laughs> to be honest. Cause they're like, what? Like we're going, we're, we're, we're going like, this is never going to work. Um, and I think once we actually spun ourselves out and people started to get used to explaining sort of who we are and that we were backed by, by BlackRock, which was, um, obviously like a really big, a uh, big financial institution. It gives us a lot of that, um, that sort of like, you know, financial, like, okay, you know, you have, you have money behind you. That's a good thing. Um, everybody started to get a little bit more confident and within, um, within a year, uh, we were so confident in our brand that we were able, even able to drop sort of any tie to GE whatsoever. Um, which was a really great feeling, um, feeling like you didn't need that as sort of like, you know, leverage anymore. Yeah, we're going to get into a great story, actually, probably the last story we're going to talk about in this podcast about a specific individual, the head of sales, and, and how you mm -hmm. kind of have these conversations and work together. But um, so give us one, first of all, I just want to be clear, when you talk about shopped around, right, I think what happened was G, it was owned by GE and ultimately was backed and funded by BlackRock. BlackRock's the owner now, right? So yep. give us a sense of the timing. <clears throat> was the rebranding before and did it did, did it help that? you know, get was, BlackRock involved or how was that? Yeah. So, um, so basically we had, um, our, our CEO had kind of positioned this within GE to say like, Hey, we know that you want, you know, that you appreciate what we're doing as a business and we're making money. So you still want, you know, a, a foot in the door, if you will, but we need a investor who can sort of, you know, give, give us the funding that we need to take this to the next level. And so GE was on board with keeping a 20% stake and then giving 80% stake of us away to whoever, you know, we all as, you know, mutual parties agreed would be the best fit. Um, and so that started, those conversations happened in late 2018, early 2019. Um, we got interest from a lot of different investors. We were actually kind of surprised at how many um, investors were interested in, in looking at our platform, our company, um, to take on that 80% 80, 80 stake. And ultimately, BlackRock and the team at BlackRock that we had been speaking to, it was just the right fit. We knew that they would be, um, they would allow us to continue to operate pretty autonomously um, the way that we were doing it. They were fully on board with our approach, our strategy, long-term strategy, where we wanted to take the business. So GE did still hold the 20% stake in us. So in that time, we were um, also negotiating internally with GE as to what does that 20% stake mean? And largely it was our ability to use the GE name, um, much like a lot of other GE ventures do where you have, so basically we were going to be whatever name we came up with and then a GE, renew or a GE Renewable Energy um, venture was sort of like the tag underneath it. So it was our way to sort of spin out, hold on to some GE parent relationship, um, but majority of our funding was coming from BlackRock. So that's kind of how that relationship worked. And that was also a part of like what I had to take into consideration when doing this brand is I had to think short term, 
we're going to be a sort of sub GE brand, if you will. But then long term, we're going to have to stand alone. And after going through um, at Comcast, I went through, I think, like three different rebrands in, a, in a, essentially like four years. Um, that was when Comcast was moving towards the Xfinity brand. Um, and we had gone through a whole bunch of different rebrands in between them. Um, and it was just too chaotic. And I knew I did not want that to happen again, um, if I could at all help it. So I had to be thinking both short, medium and long term with this. Um, and that's kind of how we've landed at DSD Renewables today. Yeah, I mean, f- first of all, that is a great approach to rebranding too. How you kind of took that gradual approach. I always think of it as, um, you know, that that uh, visual of uh, evolution where it's, you know, the first man, you, you know, you see mm-hmm. the beast crawling out of the sea, and then it turns into a man crawling and walking and stuff. And and when yeah. I've seen good rebranding, it's that evolution of how do we go from just major brand like GE to to the brand you're with. Uh, yeah. But when you mentioned um, Comcast and Xfinity, it got me thinking. You know, I used to uh, be a consultant to a company named BEA Systems, and I remember. Mm-hmm. I was at one of their events and a leader from Comcast spoke there. Comcast was a major customer. And this was before anyone had heard of Xfinity. And he had teased out, hey, you're going to, you know, you're going to be hearing about this brand Xfinity and stuff. And it was part of kind of the pre-tease of the, of the, hey, this is coming. So when we think of the kind of evolution, was there any kind of pre-tease you had to do, with, especially when you're shopping this brand around, you know, talking to uh, maybe industry analysts, talking to the marketplace, talking to funders of, of how this is going to be? I would think for anyone that's interested in investing and anyone is interested in investing and sees a GE brand, that that brand would be important or some of these marketing decisions and strategy would be important. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we, <clears throat> we had to, um, it was, it was a little bit of a, uh, a, a, I guess I would, I would call it a little bit of art meets science with this because we also had to figure out what we could, um, what we could legally coin um, in such a short period of time. So it really limited our creativity, if you will. <laughs> Hence, we landed on distributed solar development um, after um, shopping around. We, we, we had like a short list of, I don't know, 10 names or so um, that we kind of shopped around to, to various investors. And that's kind of where we all landed was distributed solar development because we could shorten it to DSD pretty easily. And being able to, you know, kind of how I pitched it to the leadership team um, was that kind of like, like HP, you know, you can at some point just leverage your acronym and that becomes your identity and that's fine. And, and down the line, people aren't going to necessarily ask what DSD stands for. Um, Is that, and that's the goal, right? That's like, that's what you're hoping to get to. You get to that point. Um, so it's not this awkward conversation. Um, that said, I did, I was very realistic with everybody involved. And I said, yes, you are going to need an elevator pitch. And I actually wrote out what your, you know, three sentence elevator pitch of what, who DSD is and what we do, um, for everybody to have <laughs> in their back pocket because I, you know, you can, you can picture people sort of stumbling over like distributed solar development. What exactly is that? Like, who are you? Like, wh- like, what are you doing? Where did you come from? And Oh, by the way, like you want to do a multi million dollar project with me. Like, how can I trust that you're a company that has money behind you? Um, so that was, that story was really important as well at the at the very beginning um is making sure that everybody was like kind of prepared for how to talk about something like this but yeah you you definitely you know you shop around a lot of stuff and then at some point you just have to make a decision right like you can't you can't just you know there's never going to be a perfect decision um and then so at some point you just need to execute and just go with it and that's kind of the approach i took (laughs) No, it's kind of it's funny you mentioned about the letters and the name. I yeah, you know, I mentioned so I just mentioned I was working with BEA Systems and I was at an event and heard about Comcast. So they don't exist anymore. They were bought by Oracle. But BEA, I was like, well, what does BEA stand for? You know, everyone called it BEA. It stood for Barry, Ed, and Alfred, the founders. You know what I mean? It didn't really yeah. have anything to do with anything. So yeah. Um, but I love that you say the elevator pitch too, because the next question I was going to ask you is: This is a Challenge for a rebrand, but challenge for any company. How do you make sure everyone in the company understands the value proposition? Because you mentioned there was concern, there was pushback and stuff. So mm-hmm. you gave everyone in the in the company an elevator pitch, like a three line elevator pitch to really understand, okay, here's here's who we are and why we are and that, that sort of yeah. thing. 
Yeah, That's exactly. Great. And um, and it's funny, I think, because um, it talked about throwing a lot at, uh, at a business uh, at once. So we were spinning out a GE, um, you know, go, basically developing a new relationship with a new investor. Um, in addition, what the reason why we spun out of GE is because, like I said, GE is a is a company that that creates and sells things for profit. Solar development is not something that you necessarily build and and sell for profit immediately. The value proposition of um, CNI Solar, in particular, is owning assets long term, and you get this long term return on these you know twenty five plus year assets, solar assets, when you have this like um, recurring revenue model through a what's called a PPA agreement, which is essentially just, it's very similar to your cable agreement where, you know, customers pay you for the energy that's produced um, from the solar array that's located on their um, house. They don't actually have to pay for the solar array itself to get built. So they don't have any sort of upfront capital. And that's where the value for our business comes out of it. Um, we were not able, we wouldn't have been able to do that within GE. Having BlackRock come in and back us allowed us to do that. So now we're also sort of changing what is our like revenue model. We're changing, you know, what are um, really sort of where we are in the market um, as we're making all of these other changes too. So it was a lot to ask a, a young organ, a young small organization of about, you know, 40 to 50 people at the time. Um, but luckily like that's the time you do it, right? That's the time you do it when you have like just a few people that you need to sort of change the ship instead of changing this like massive cruise ship, you're changing, you know, a, you know, 13 foot boat instead. Um, so, so yeah, so that was, it was really important for us to have that story sort of written out for everybody early on. Well, thanks for sharing a lot about kind of corporate strategy, the business strategy level. But I also wanted to ask on the personal level for you, for Megan, like you're talking about rebranding from one of the legendary brands, GE, my gosh, yeah. you know. And so I just wonder, you know, at a personal level, what was that like for you? Because So we have this uh, free digital marketing course. I love this quote from Flint McLaughlin who teaches it in session two. He says, the key to transformative marketing is a transformed marketer. So you're talking a lot about transforming the brand and the company. What did you have to transform in yourself to make that rebranding possible? Honestly, I think it was, um, I had to have, I, I needed to, to drum up some confidence that I don't know where it came from. Um, <laughs> but, and, and uh, like, I basically had to tell my, repeatedly tell myself, like, you're the only person in the room right now who's thinking about this. So you've, you, you know, you've just got to do it. You, um, you know, you, you make good decisions. You've come this far. Worst comes to worse, it fails and you have to go find another job, but you have good credibility behind you. So you could probably find another job if you needed to. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, it was, it was, it was really that it was, um, it was just trying to take, um, trying to just be as, confident as I could about my decisions. Um, and it was a task that I had never really been tasked with before. I have never, I'd never been um, really the only owner of something this big before. Um, and so I knew that it was going to be either very rewarding, or I would learn valuable lessons from it. And either way, I was all in. Well, that's great. Well, hopefully that gives yeah. a vote of confidence to anyone who's listening right now who's going through a rebrand. If Megan can rebrand from General Electric, you can rebrand from whatever you've got to rebrand from. Uh, let's talk about yes. your next your next lesson. When no one is raising their hand for something that can make an impact, raise your hand. So how did you learn this? Yeah, so in a very unglamorous way, um, back at Comcast, we <clears throat> when I was working for Comcast Business, we were basically a small organization within the bigger organization. And Comcast as a whole had, you know, it's a company that's been around since like, I guess the 50s or something like that. And, um, and we had basically built our CRM off of our billing system, which nowadays seems completely ridiculous to do. Um, but it was one of those things that it just happened over time where all of our information about our customers was in our billing system, because that's how we originally, you know, got to know them. Um, and then it just it continued to evolve. And at some point, 
it was breaking. It was just breaking left and right. So we knew we had to completely sort of separate the billing system part of billing to from a CRM like and create like an actual CRM. So they decided to come to us first because we were a smaller business. They could you know, work out the kinks. But of course, we were a smaller business. We didn't own our billing system. We didn't, you know, we kind of leveraged everything that they did on the residential side. Um, so nobody was like a billing system expert per se. Um, and so we needed to figure out a way to do this. And um, I knew that because there was nobody else who was an expert here, I was like, well, this is a good way for me to quickly learn about our customers and quickly learn about our systems. And I thought it was going to be like a easy project to sort of do as sort of an add on to my regular day to day job. Um, And it turned out to be kind of this like nightmarish side project where like things were just so broken and needed to be untangled and it was gross. But I was like one of the first people to raise my hand and say like, sure, I'll take this on. Obviously, everybody else knew better than me. um, So there's a little bit of that in this too. But having been a part of that and it gave me exposure to leaders across the organization who um, I've said were basically voluntold that they need to make this happen um, as in, hey, this needs to happen for the business. The residential side slash the behemoth that is Comcast needs this to happen. So it's on us to do it. Like you got to go do it. Um, So I got exposure to some great leaders across the organization. I learned way more about our organization than I ever would have in, you know, just years of working there um, in a relatively short period of time. Um, And it also gave me a real appreciation for standing up systems and how much work needs to get be put into it and things like, you know, um, uh, just, just, you know, testing, beta testing, and how important that stuff is. Um, I think that you take it for granted if you don't have to be a part of it. Um, Like I said, incredibly unglamorous. I never wanted to do it again. Um, it was a very sort of unsexy part of marketing, um, and, you know, very loosely a part of marketing, but it was standing up a CRM system. So, you know, now that you appreciate sort of how that sausage is made a little bit more, um, you can, um, you, 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 you develop that appreciation and you learn from it. Right. Um, and it also gave me a leg up, um, in terms of other folks in the organization that didn't have that, uh, that experience and that knowledge now that I, that I had been able to develop in a short period of time. Well, first of all, I love that term voluntold. I had not, <laughs> I had not known that if you're not going to volunteer, you're voluntold. <laughs> and when you, when you mentioned you're like a smaller, like a smaller customer, what you were actually working for Comcast, it was just you on the B2B side, right? And the, cut, exactly. the consumer side was higher. Yeah. 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 yeah which is, which is um, now known as Comcast business. Um, okay. Speaking of, uh, speaking of how brands are made, um, Comcast business class, when we first uh, developed Comcast business as as an actual um, uh, an actual company within Comcast. Um, the, the name was Comcast Business Class. Developed on an airplane. Um, two executives <laughs> were on an airplane, and they knew they had to come up with a name for this business by the time they landed. That's how we got Comcast Business Class. Well, I'm glad it wasn't Comcast <laughs> Overhead Bin or something like that. I know, so. exactly. <laughs> Comcast yeah, yeah. Carry On. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned how the sausage was made. So this is where I think it can really help. Like as you as you grow in your career, as you raise, as you, you mentioned, you've managed budgets up to 10 million people. You've managed up to teams of 15. Like has that experience of being in the trenches given you now a better understanding of how you work with the IT department? Because one thing I found totally. in my career, I mean, I get to work in software early in my career, which was helpful. One thing, it's, I hate to say this, but but like IT is almost like the quicksand where good marketing ideas go because it seems like you've got this brilliant marketing idea, you go and it just it's it just dredges through there and it comes out on the other side. Like you said, two years later, looking totally different, all dirty. So, yeah. how, how has that improved your ability to work with IT departments? Yeah, I, just just in terms of like um, how to speak with them and and speak in their language, right? Um, understanding the. It, yeah, like how they will translate your ask into something that you're like, that's not what I asked for. And they're like, this is exactly what you asked for. And you're like, but it's not working the way I wanted it to. And it's like, well, this is what you asked for. Um, being able to, you know, go through those iterations on a number of different, uh, like, you know, digital marketing infrastructure type projects 
um, has been incredibly helpful because now I know, you know, to be really spe- like how specific you actually need to be when they ask for requirements. Like the term requirement um, is means something very different in from a like digital infrastructure perspective than it does from like a user perspective, right? Like. I require it to be necessary that I, I, you know, capture these five fields. But to them, that's like, okay, great. We'll make those required fields. But then how they translate on the back end could be something very different in terms of like why you required them. So it's like, you know, you have to be really specific throughout. Be very careful with your words. Um, whiteboard as much as humanly possible, which is hard to do these days um, in this, you know, very virtual world that we live in. But um, like really understanding like that, making yourself, um, I guess I should say, being very descriptive in terms of what you expect the outcome to be um, as early on in the po- as possible in the process is like key so that you're not figuring things out when you're in like user acceptance testing. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we as marketers, sometimes we're so focused on external communication. Like, hey, if you're communicating to the, you know, executive team of BlackRock or whatever, that's exciting. I'm going to focus on that. And we can just overlook that internal communication that's so essential, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's talk about your next lesson. You mentioned customer experience and feedback are vital to success. So how, how did you learn yeah. this? Yeah. So um, that, I, again, back at Comcast, and I, I usually harp on that part of my career because it was the largest chunk of my career at this point. But, um, but we, um, Comcast, all, I mean, if you, unless you live under a rock, Comcast has a reputation of having poor customer service. It's a utility. Nobody likes their utility. That's, that's where it is at the end of the day. Um, but at Comcast business in particular, um, we, we were launching a partner program and my um, boss at the time, Kathy Hickey, um, had a lot of experience launching partner programs at other organizations, including IBM, um, I believe. And um, one of the things that she told me was like one of the key part, key successes to a, um, a partnership program is making sure that they are invested in you as a partner too. So whatever you can do to sort of bring them in and make them feel part of the organization, um, you are going to get far more out of those partners by doing so. And so part of that includes just listening to them, understanding what their needs are, understanding what they're looking for from you. Um, And so we were able to do that. And we built out one of the, if not now, the industry's strongest partner program um, in, uh, in Comcast business, uh, by doing that. So like our, our partners really do feel like they are invested in our success as well as their own success. Um, and that's, that's really key. And I just, I see customer experience and we say, and when you say customer, that is everything from the people who pay your bills to, um, your employees, to partners that you work with, um, your vendors, Um, that all of those individual customers and various transactions that you do in quotes um, on a day-to-day basis, uh, you know, that experience is everything. And trying to make that the best experience means that you're going to have, you're going to get more out of everybody involved. Um, And and just everybody will do better is, is what I've seen, at least in my, in my experience. I wonder if you think back, can you think of one, one or two of the most surprising things you learned from getting that feedback? Because, you know, that, that's our challenge as marketers. We've got this blind spot. We're so focused on our brands. We don't, we don't see it through customers' eyes. What really what, what surprised you? Um, I think uh, the, the fact that it's, it doesn't take much. It's not, you don't need to whine and dine and throw a lot of money at people. Um, listening, just, just the act of listening can make a world of difference in their eyes. If they feel like they've been heard um, and feel like needs have been addressed in some way, shape or form, you don't have to solve everything. You don't need to find, you don't need to find a solution for everything. But the fact that you've actually addressed it and say, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't fix this one issue because of X, Y, and Z. At least they feel like they've been heard. It's been addressed and we can all move on. 
Um, and so I think it's, it's that, that it really just, it doesn't take a whole lot of extra effort to make a lot of difference. You know, and it's, it's funny you mentioned too about, you know, cable companies having a bad reputation in terms of customer service, because I think that's also the difference between actual value and perceived value. And our job as yeah. marketers to influence perceived value. And so you're talking about listening to customers. That's one way to influence that perceived value that they see you're listening. Mm -hmm. We had on uh, Michael Diamond and on the podcast previously is now at NYU, but he was uh, the former acting CMO of Time Warner Cable. And he mentioned, so at Time Warner Cable, we did a yep. lot to improve our customer service. Didn't really matter. People still thought we had horrible customer yep. service. You know, they, yep. So then they, they launched a marketing campaign, an advertising campaign, a funny one about how the customer service was better. Like, I think there was a guy ready to go on hold for the cable company and do all these things. And he was surprised because they picked up so quick. And so yep. I think that's an example, too, of like the first thing you have to do. The best marketing is a great product, right? The first thing right. you have to do is improve the actual value you give to customers. But that's not enough. <laughs> then as marketers, we need to make sure they perceive that value. Exactly. So, Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and that's actually a, a fantastic point because, um, you know, going back to what, you know, listening to customers and getting their feedback and things like that. Um, I think you and I have, have talked about like the idea of you hear customers and sometimes you only hear the loudest customers. So you think you're solving for something that is this mass problem and you realize you have it at all. You've just placated, perhaps placated, a small number of your loudest customers. Um, and instead, there are these you know, you know, root cause issues below the surface that you really should have spent your time addressing instead. Um, and they're just not bubbling up because probably because your customers don't care anymore. Like they're no longer invested in you as a brand and you as a company. And at that point you've lost them. So getting to some of those root causes of, uh, or those root issues um, is, is really important. And that's something that you may not get with just listening to, you know, or just doing, launching a customer survey, for example, you get, end up getting this, um, this bias of respondents. Yeah, I love that. So I've written before about, you know, the customer is always right, but not always right for your company. And the the analogy I love to use, I don't know, are you a Simpsons fan at all? Do you watch the Simpsons at all? I, I yes. Yes. Okay. So this is an older Simpsons. I don't even remember it, but it's Homer Simpson. He finds out his brother, he's got a brother he didn't know about. He owns a car company and he's like, wow. And say so they reunite. They're so excited. Anyway, his brother sees Homer Simpson. He's like, this is the average guy. This is what we're missing. We don't have it. Yep. And so he tells his product developers, you listen to that guy, do whatever he says. Yep. So then towards the end of the episode, you don't talk about the car comes out and it's ridiculous. It, it plays like La Cucaracha. It's got, like, <laughs> it's a, it got this crazy like big gulp holder that's massive. It's, that a, Homer like, like, like a, it's a Homer <laughs> car. Yeah. So they made it for Homer, right? They didn't make it for that, that customer. Right. So do you, can you think, I know you mentioned you had like 20 examples of, yeah, of yeah. Um, customer experience. Do you think of any specific example where Either you kind of started going down that road or you just kind of were hearing things from a customer or maybe a, maybe a, a business leader, a, a boss that was saying, hey, mm -hmm. do this thing. And you're like, well, wait a minute, I think, I think that person's just really loud. I don't know if that would really serve our customer base. Yeah, so, um, so this actually happened at Tesla for us um, because – Tesla's is customers. It, is it the farting of the Tesla? Don't tell me. If that was that, <laughs> <laughs> was no. that just for one person? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's that was the homer but, for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, but the, but this ended up happening. So um, I joined Tesla as part of the. I was with Solar City prior, and um, when when Tesla acquired Solar City, I joined Tesla as part of that acquisition. So um, we had gone from Solar City was a mass market residential solar installer, you know, all, all across the country. And then Tesla was this, you know, high end vehicle um, uh, manufacturer that had a very small customer base, very, very exclusive customer base, um, very particular customer base. And those were the most loyal customers on the planet. Like a Tesla customer is incredible incredibly loyal. It's like a dream from a marketing perspective, which is why Elon Musk doesn't think marketing is, is a requirement for, for a business. Um, and so, which was just interesting in and of itself working as part of a marketing organization for a CEO that didn't believe in marketing. But um, uh, that's, a, that's a whole other story. But so we would sit there and we would try to sell solar 
to, we could sell solar to our current embedded customer base, Tesla customer base. It was a no brainer. They were like, yes, we want, we want clean energy. We like, we're happy to pay for it. Like it was a no brainer. But what we were missing is how do we tell our story to the mass market? So as we introduced new energy products like battery, like, uh, like storage for your house, you know, a battery for your house and, you know, solar roof and things like that, we couldn't be talking to our tiny embedded base or else the product would never work. We would never make any money if we only sold, you know, hundreds to thousands of this thing. We need to sell hundreds of thousands to millions of this stuff. And we didn't know how to talk. We were solely talking to the embedded Tesla customer. So I knew early on, like something needed to change because like, there's no way this, sto- this is going to translate to a mass market audience in the way we needed to. Um, and that was challenge. It was a challenge internally uh, to get folks on board because, because the Tesla folks weren't used to having this sort of mass market appeal. Um, and it was scary for their brand. Um, and then you also had a bunch of folks that had come from the Solar City side that said, "How come this isn't working as well as it did when we were at Solar City?" Um, and they just didn't understand how it wasn't translating. So, um, so that was definitely it was it was definitely a challenge and one that um, I'm not sure how successful I was at it, just given I didn't have a whole lot of stake in the organization on it. But um, it's something that I think Tesla probably still struggles with a little bit um, to this day um, of getting sort of that mass mass market solar appeal and energy appeal out the door. Um, It's definitely been easier with their sort of more more mass market friendly auto lines for sure, like the three um, and the Y. But um, but yeah, that 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 definitely was sort of that issue. Yeah, well, since you brought it up, it's too juicy to, to miss about maybe if there's any marketing lessons you have from Elon Musk, because from mm-hmm. what I see externally, uh, you know, no one has been better able to build a tribe around eco-friendly, climate-friendly product than Elon mm-hmm. Musk. And it's funny because, you know, on the, on the BlackRock side, they also seem like the organization that is doing more than anyone else to build a tribe, so to speak, in the B2B world around mm-hmm. considering climate. So I wonder, what, what, did you, any marketing lessons stick out from Elon Musk? Um, yeah, I think, uh, and it kind of goes to that, um, back to sort of like that, that confidence and that lean in. Um, I mean, the man's, a, the man's a genius. You can't argue that. And he has this amazing vision that he just accepts as reality, um, which I think is is both, it's a blessing and a curse a little bit. I think it's, it's amazing because that's, that's how you get true believers, um, to follow like his, his, like you said, to to basically become part of this tribe and it's doing great things for not only, not only for climate change, but SpaceX and the, and the, um, the whole sort of, you know, reopening of, of our, you know, exploration of space that could not have been done without Elon Musk. So you cannot argue that he is a visionary. He's an incredibly smart man and you get that following from that. Um, it becomes a little dangerous because you also have to think about the, the, how far you're willing to go to make something like that happen. And unfortunately I think people get, I mean, at the end of the day, people have to work for him and have to get the stuff done. And sometimes it's not the greatest experience um, working for somebody like that. Um, so I think that's a, that's a lesson as well Is like, you know, you can't, it's one thing to be a visionary, but you also have to remember that it takes, it takes a lot of people and you need to have those people on board with you. You need to treat them well all along the way, um, uh, to make sure that your vision really comes to light, um, in the best way possible. Well, I think that's really a great transition for the next part of our podcast where we talk about lessons from some of the people you collaborated and work with. And you have a lot of lessons here about not just marketing, but actually working mm-hmm. and what it's like to be a human being working in a company. And so we kind of use do this part of the podcast. We talk about Elon Musk. I, you know, back in the day, I remember writing this post, forget Charlie Sheen, here are five marketing lessons from marketers. Because there was this thing in marketing where it was always like marketing lessons from Charlie Sheen, marketing lessons from Justin Bieber, marketing lessons from Steve Jobs. And I always kind of felt like, well... 
I'm not Steve Jobs. I'm not Elon Musk. And you are. And maybe we need to look around at the people we're actually working with on a day-to-day basis and see what marketing lessons can we get from them or what career lessons, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So let's start with that. The first person you talk about is Nita Wright, Global Marketing Director of SES Satellites. And uh, your lesson was your company is not your advocate. You need to advocate for yourself. So how'd you learn that from Nita? Yeah, so she actually hired me um, at Comcast when I up from the get go um, as sort of like a regional marketing manager um, or assistant manager at the time, um, right out of undergrad. And so she was my first like full time boss, um, and she was a great mentor. Um, and you know, over time, my career kind of went one way, her career went a different way. Um, but we still stayed very close and very in touch. And and um, I still sort of u- utilized her as a mentor. Um, but at, at one point in her career, the company just wasn't valuing her for what she felt she had brought to the table and what I knew she had brought to the table too. Um, and so at the end of the day, she said, you know what? Like, I don't owe this company anything. Why am I sticking around? And that really, that really stuck to me because I had seen, especially working for a large organization like Comcast, where you had people and like GE, for example, you have people that have been there their entire careers and they have, they have, they have built their careers on the notion of if I give enough time to this company, the company will give it back to me. And that's not the case. At the end of the day, the company doesn't owe you anything. It is up to you whether you want to stick around for that long. Like, yes, there might be incentives to stay. There might be, um, you know, but you're you're not going to work your way up just by doing time. Um, That notion is, is sort of like out the door at this point. And so you should always be doing what's what's best for yourself and your career um, and not expect the com- not expect anything from the company really. Um, and that was, that was really valuable because not only did that help me sort of look at what my value was and what I thought I brought to the table, but it also made me feel more comfortable and confident in like, okay, if the company doesn't owe me anything, I don't owe anything to the company either. So while I mo- may owe something to my boss, who's been able to you know, mentor me. And so I want to make sure that I don't leave them hanging, for example, or the people I work with, but, but the organization itself, like I, I shouldn't feel like I'm tied to it in any way, shape or form. And that was really freeing. Yeah. And I I think it probably goes to uh, a version of the brand customer relationship, right? Because earlier in the, in this episode, when you were talking about rebranding from GE, I was like, Hey, that seems like a big thing. How'd that go? And you're like, this goes South. You know, I've got I've got other options, which I think <laughs> yeah. is a way of saying I have a personal value proposition in the marketplace. I have, you know, a personal brand. And so we are always, I think, trying to deliver value to our companies right through that value proposition. But it's a two-way street. And there needs mm-hmm. also to be a value proposition to the employee. And I think really that's a great lesson for any any leaders listening now. So, you know, we talk about the tight labor market. Recently wrote an article about what are marketing leaders doing to help recruit and keep people now. And there were a lot of creative ideas in there, like the four-day work weekend, different things like mm-hmm. that, where it's about not just, okay, pure productivity <laughs> and how much can we, you know, get people in an office and four walls and staring at a computer and being in meetings, but, you know, what do they need? And then at the end of the day, you know, can we give them what they need? And they can also give us back. If they can do it in four days, right? If they can be productive and we can create, you know, enough margin in all these four days, let's do that for people. And there's a mutual value proposition. And there's many, many other other things that can yeah. happen too. Um, so I think the next story is probably the opposite uh, of what we were just talking about, the flip side of a, a company doing a good job of, of, you know, or at least marketing leaders doing a good job of mm-hmm. kind of creating a value proposition for you. Uh, you specifically called out, Corey Ang, Senior Vice President of Product Management and Systems at GTT, Mark Schweitzer, Partner at CMG Partners, and Bill Stemper, President of Comcast Business. And you said, appreciate your employees, let them challenge themselves, provide feedback, and grow, even if it means you're going to lose them. So tell us this story. This sounds like a juicy one. Yeah, so um, Corey was was the... um, the vice president of marketing for um, Comcast business when I joined it. And um, he, he was really great in trying to elevate his team. And by elevate, I mean, make sure that we were at the table. 
And so he would invite me to meetings with with higher ups, even though, you know, I was just the manager at the time. Um, and, you know, two two folks down from from him. Um, and he would make sure that I was not just a fly on the wall in the meeting either. Like he would, you know, ask for opinions and solicit feedback and things like that. So so I was a voice in the room. Um, and he sort of allowed me to to do that. And he would give me he would trust me with things um, and give me some autonomy. And it was the first time I, re- I had ever really experienced that from somebody at that level um, within an organization. And I, I really valued it. And not only did it challenge me, but it also made me like, made me want to make him proud, right? It made me want to do a really good job and excel at it so that, um, so that he would shine too. And so I think that that sort of like mutual um, uh, like lifting up of, of folks is, is really important. And then down the line, um, Mark Schweitzer um, and Bill Stemper, both, uh, again, both leaders within Comcast business um, at the highest levels. Um, again, they, they just, you know, they, they allowed me to make decisions. Um, they showed appreciation when um, my boss at the time had to go out on maternity leave and I kind of covered her. When she came back, Mark made it a point to, you know, to pull me aside and say, I really appreciated you filling in for her. You did an outstanding job. I'm going to give you like this bonus, like, you know, this type of like mini promotion sort of thing, just to show how much that that mattered. And that was really like, I just thought I was doing my job and to, you know, to be called out. Um, I felt rejuvenated and it was like, oh, like it's nice to feel valued and to feel like, uh, like your, you going above and beyond was actually appreciated. Um, and then when I had, um, I was making the decision of whether to sort of leave my career at Comcast to go and pursue my MBA full time, um, Bill Stemper, who's the president, um, of the business, actually invited me into his office to talk to him about it. And he was, he was um, a Wharton alum. And so he came, he kind of came to it. He's like, look, he's like, on the one hand, I want to tell you to go to Wharton because it will change your life. And it changed my life. And it's a fantastic thing. He's like, on the other hand, I really don't want to lose you as an employee. But he was, but he was very honest and straightforward. And he was like, look, it like this is this I'm gonna lay it on the table. We really, really, really appreciate you here. You will always have a role here if you ever want to come back. Um, but but I think you should pursue this like this is a fantastic opportunity if you want to pursue it. Like you have all of our support. And um and it was just it was just really great to again just like feel valued, but also feel like they wanted me to succeed no matter what. Um like in or out of the company. Um, and, you know, I take that very seriously um, with my team today. I make sure they know that part of their goals on an annual basis are not just the deliverables that they need to do for the company, but I ask them to put their own sort of career goals included in that. And like, you know, do you want to have an opportunity to speak at a an event? Do you want to pursue... Um, do you want to understand a different area of the business more? Like, th- like, what do you want to do personally um, to to sort of feel more fulfilled in your career um, as well? And I make sure that they prioritize that too, because um, I know how much that that meant to me. And I think at the end of the day, if you have well rounded employees um, and employees that feel valued, you're just going to get that much more out of them. That's a great takeaway, and that's a great lesson. <clears throat> Anyone else comply, whether we're have direct reports or not. I think the thing that's really heartening about your story is, you know, once we get into organizations, companies, departments, whatever we want to call them, you know, it, they just kind of naturally strip out the humanity we have for each other for some way. You know, like, I mean, often people behave differently at work than they do yeah. with their friends or whatever like that. So see, at such a big company like Comcast, which as you said before, is basically a utility, that some of those leaders there did not lose that humanity. And they're like, hey, this is another individual that's in the same shoes I was. And yeah. even though it might hurt me personally or hurt the company, like to, to, to for this individual's life and career, like, what can I do to do that? I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
Let's talk about your final story. It's with someone you're currently working with, and it kind of brings the podcast back around in a circle this episode because it's what we talked about in the beginning, that very big thing, rebranding from General Electric. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned Eric Pollack, who is the chief commercial officer from DSD Renewables, and you said, when you find people you work well with, stick together, and you'll always enjoy what you do. So how have yeah. you and Eric stuck together, especially through this, you know, spinoff, this rebranding and all this stuff going on? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, um, I actually remember from when he, um, he, he was one of the people I interviewed with before joining GE. And I remember um, our interview conversation felt more like just like a conversation. Like it, it felt like we had been, we were like at a, at a networking event or something like that. And we were like having a conversation over a beer. Like it was so comfortable and we were on the same page with so much stuff. And it just like, we just clicked really well together um, in terms of like how we think about things, how we think about the business, how we think about our industry. Um, and, and that was, it was just very comfortable. And since then, like there have been times where he and I, through this whole process, we've had to work very closely with this whole rebranding because he, um, he manages the entire commercial side of the business, um, including all of our sales team. And even he at first was like, oh, Megan, I don't know how we're going to make this work. Like, <laughs> I don't know that I believe it. And I'm just, I'm just like, Eric, just like, just, just lean in. I was like, just <laughs> say it with confidence. Cause if you don't say it with confidence, nobody else is going to either. And so, um, so I got, he was like, okay, I'm going to trust you. And I, I earned that trust from him. And sure enough, like it, it worked. And we both, um, we both, we have, we have conversations on a weekly basis and, um, he's out in California. I'm on the East coast, but we always connect on a weekly basis. And we're always just like amazed at what we've done with this business. And it feels very much like, um, I don't know, like it's, a, it's, it's very much a collaborative friendship type relationship, even though he's my boss, where um, it, we, we, like I said, we're so on the same page with a lot of stuff. And we also kind of like look around and we're like, huh, we've kind of done this. Wow. Like this is, this is kind of crazy that we've done this. And um, we take that sort of like mutual pride and, and it makes my job that much more enjoyable. He finds his job that much more enjoyable too, I think. Um, and so like, it's just, it's, um, you'll, you'll never, if you find those people to work with and it's a joy to work with them, then you'll never feel like you're actually going to work. Right. And I know that that's said a lot where like, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Um, it's, it's really true. And I find that could, that comes across most with the people I work with and finding the joy in the people that I work with makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, you know, we throw that word around team a lot, right, yeah. in marketing. But, but I mean, truly being a team is a beautiful thing, pulling it for is. each other. Yep, uh, yep. All right, well, Megan, we covered a wide swath of territory today about what it means to be a marketer. My gosh. So if you could leave us with some final words of wisdom, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? I think at first and foremost, you have to be an effective listener. Um, and that really requires a level of, of EQ and being able to put yourself in other people's shoes um, and really think about, you know, how other people are getting to a particular outcome or, um, or idea. Um, and, and yeah, just being a good listener, I think, is, is incredibly incredibly important and i think it's something that people don't think about enough well it was a pleasure listening to you megan i learned so much thanks for being with it's us it's been today. a pleasure being on thank you so much for having me and thanks to you all for listening as well have a good one thank you for joining us for how i made it in marketing with daniel burstein now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A dot com.